So I've been lucky, uh, I think, in the last year to do uh, four or five trips to Israel, often called the Startup Nation. There's a lot of incredible work going there. And I was able to visit uh, the Center for Hyperbaric Medicine, uh, led by Dr. Shai Efrati. Um, and uh, Shai is a professor at the Tel Aviv uh, University Medical School, a neurologist, and exploring uh, a really new, uh, exciting intervention using hyperbarics for impacting uh, brain health. Dr. Shai, thanks. Thanks. Hi, Daniel. Good morning to everybody. I'm very happy to be here. And before starting in the next 20 minutes speaking about our new therapeutic approach, we need first to understand what we are dealing with. And with regard to that, we should look at, at the target. And you can see on the right side, you can see the universe. It's big. It's actually huge. It's clear to all of us that it will be very hard for us to understand all the different ingredients and all the different connections that we have in this big universe. On the left, we see the brain. It's not the brain, it's a single neuronal cell. And again, by looking at it, we can say this is, this is huge. It will be very hard for us to understand all the interrelation between the different ingredients that we have in that system. So the main question for me as a physician, when I want to do something applicable to the patient, is how can I simplify, how can we simplify such a complex biological system. And in order to simplify things, we can look at this, and I'm sorry for the picture. Again, on the right, we see a classical wound, a wound that we are all familiar with. If we look at the distal part of the foot, we can see a necrotic tissue, a totally lost tissue. We cannot help that tissue. It will fall down. But proximal to it, we can see a tissue that is damaged, but it's not fully dead. And if we will bring good oxygenation and stem cell, this tissue could heal. On the right, what do we see? It's the same thing. We see a wound. In the center of the wound, we see a necrotic tissue that is totally lost. And surrounding this necrotic tissue, we see tissue that if we will bring good oxygenation, stem cell, this tissue can heal. What is the main difference between the two? The main difference is that the wound in the leg, we see, we understand what we are dealing with. But the wound over here, it's high tech. We are looking at CT, we are looking at MRI, we're speaking about the brain in a mystic fashion cognitive, memory, personality, it's a tissue. And today, it's quite clear to us that the basic things that are needed in order to repair, to heal a peripheral wound, are the same basic things that we need in order to heal the wounds that we have up here. And the major Four things that we need as basic for any healing process include energy, because of course if we don't have enough oxygen supply to the tissue, nothing will happen. We need a trigger for any regenerative process. We need the trigger to start it. We need stem cells, and we need angiogenesis, generation of new blood vessels. And I will say a couple of words of each. With regard to the brain, you know, the brain is up here. It's 2% of our body, but it consumes more than 23% of the total oxygen demand of the whole body. At each time point, the brain utilizes all the oxygen that is being delivered. And all the brain needs to do is to make a preparation where should the oxygen go now? Which is the most important part at the moment? So if I'm moving the hand, 
the perfusion will go more to the part that is responsible for the motor movement in the hand. If it's the leg, it's the leg. We can see it in perfusion MRI. We're all familiar with it in our daily clinic and routine. When I'm driving a car and I'm listening to a cellular phone, having a discussion, I'm missing the turn. It's a physiological limitation. Why do I miss the turn? Because the perfusion now is being transformed mostly to the part that is responsible for the discussion that I have now, and less for the navigation. So I will miss the turn. In order to understand whether oxygen is indeed a rate-limiting factor for brain activity on healthy human being at standard condition, we are using this. This is our hyperbaric center. You saw it before with Daniel. That's how it looks. It's quite different than most, what most of you can think about. And we can take patient in. We can play with whatever we want. Pressure, gases. This is my playground. I love physiology, and this is what I love to do. So we can take people inside, and we took students of neuropsychologists who are considered to be very smart. We put them in, and we ask them to do multitasking. We ask them to do a motor function together with a cognitive. It's quite problematic. You can try to do the both together. It's not easy. And we ask them to do it in normal condition and in a hyperbaric oxygen condition. And we can see quite clearly that even at healthier condition, fully functioned, fully healthy brain, we can see that when we are increasing the amount of oxygen to a certain level, our ability to do higher tasks is significantly improvement. Needless to say, what happens when we have brain pathology? So we have the first one. The next is the trigger. If we want to initiate something, we need to trigger it. And the most powerful trigger that we have in our body for a generative process is hypoxia. Hypoxia is in the news during the last two weeks because there are three Nobel Prize winners on the hypoxic, hypoxic-induced factor cascade. When we have hypoxia, HIF, HIF stands for hypoxic-induced factor, is going up. HIF is a transcriptor factor. And once it's up, a lot of gene down the cascade will be up regulators. Among other, we have, for example, the VGF. VGF stands for vascular endothelial growth factor. We will have new blood vessels that will be generated. It happens to be that what the body actually feels is not absolute value of oxygen. The body, at the cellular level, feels the fluctuation. So what we are doing, because hypoxia is quite dangerous, we are taking the patient into the chamber, increasing the oxygen to a very high level, and then do a fast decline, asking them to take the mask off and then on again. By doing this fluctuation, the body senses the decline from hyperoxic to normal oxic as hypoxia. And then we are inducing the HIF. We call it the hyperoxic hypoxic paradox. On the cellular level, we can see that when we are doing that, the cell reacts by increasing HIF. We can see it also on the tissue level. And this is brains of rats. We can see the induction of HIF. And we can see it also in human beings that are coming to repeatable treatment. We can see that after 30 sessions and 60 sessions, actually the outside environment is being sensed by us as hypoxia, even though we are not at hypoxia at all. So we have the HIF. Another thing that we need is stem cells. I don't need to say to this audience what is stem cells. I'm playing a lot with them in our lab. But we thought about taking the stem cells to the next level, meaning instead of taking them out and injecting them in, to stimulate the body to do the proliferation of the stem cells. And how do we do that? Again, with the fluctuation. High oxygen, and then a fast decline back to the normal. By doing that, you can see the dramatic increase in the hematopoietic stem cells that we measure in blood sample. 
But more than that, and this is the most exciting thing, for the first time we can see that we can trigger also proliferation of mesenchymal stem cells in humans. The mesenchymal cells, cells are the cells that we have in the tissue. We can see that we can make them proliferate to such an amount that we can actually detect them in the blood. What will happen if we will take the best plant in the world and put it in the desert environment that you see on the right? Probably not much. It will die. But if we will take this plant and put it in a good land with enough water, it will grow and proliferate. Meaning it's not enough to take the stem cells, especially if we are dealing with an injured tissue. As you can see over here, you can see on the left, normal perfused tissue. But this is not the tissue that we have the damage in. We have the damage in relatively hypoperfused tissue, where we don't have sufficient oxygen. We don't have sufficient water for the plants. In this case, if we will put the stem cells over here, it will be very hard for them to grow. Taking this tissue into the hyperbaric oxygen environment, it means that we can increase the dissolved oxygen in the blood to an amount that we don't need the red blood cells anymore. Once we are going above two atmospheres, the amount of the dissolved oxygen in the blood is sufficient for all the energy demand. So the blood, the oxygen, is going by diffusion even to a bad perfused tissue. Well, this is good, but if we want to do something persistent, we need the angiogenesis. And for angiogenesis, we will need stem cells, trigger, and energy. So we have it all. And we did. We can see clearly the angiogenesis generated. This is a rat model of stroke. And we can see it even more beautiful, as you can see over here in our normal aging rat cohort. We have an aging cohort of rats in our lab. And we can see that by inducing them the hyperbaric, not the hyperbaric, it's the fluctuation that we generate with the oxygen, we can stimulate angiogenesis in the brain. We can see it also in humans by using perfusion MRI. We can see the change in the cerebral blood flow and cerebral blood volume. And that means that we can actually generate angiogenesis in the human brain. So now we have it all. We have the energy, we have the trigger, we have the stem cells, and we have the angiogenesis. So the next most important question is, what is the optimal wound? How can we select the optimal wound that will be suitable for that treatment? And in order to do that, we need a good brain imaging. We need an imaging that combine anatomical with metabolic imaging of the brain. And that's what we are doing over here. We are taking SPECT together with MRI, combine them together, simplifying things by letting us, the physician, who are not very smart, until not, until not the one who's standing in front of you, we need it, I need it very simple, and we're using colors. And in blue, we mark the area that is necrotic, that is completely dead. Green is the metabolic dysfunction, and red is the fully functioned tissue. And you can see quite clearly that the blue stay blue. Whatever is necrotic, stay necrotic. But the green, the metabolic dysfunction tissue, can be rejuvenated and regenerated. The clinical presentation will follow the part that was healed, meaning if that part is responsible for the hand, the hand will move, the leg, the head will move. And the most important thing, we can also set the expectation with the patient. We can tell him, I don't think that your leg will move, but I think you will speak again. Do you want to take it, yes or not? He might say no, 
He might say yes. If he say yes, his wife might say, no, I don't want him to speak. I don't do want him to speak. That's another tissue. It's very exciting to sit and discuss with it with the patient. But this is our job. This is another example, another classical example. This is a stroke patient that cannot move the hand and the leg. And you can see in the upper row on left, you can see the metabolic dysfunction tissue that is responsible for the hand and the leg. The green become yellow, and it means that the hand and the legs are moving again. On the second row, you can see the broca marking green. She cannot speak. And after the treatment, she can speak. It's not that we were treating her speaking capabilities. We are only treating wounds. And whatever this wound is responsible to, that will happen. Our business is wound care. It doesn't matter when the wound is. We can see additional different examples, and today we are using perfusion MRI NDTI, and this is another example. You can see the classical MRI, anatomical MRI on the left. You can see the perfusion from the MRI combined with the anatomical imaging. And you can see the before and after, and you can see how the cognitive function were significantly improved. Again, we are not treating cognitive function. We are treating wounds. We have an ongoing project on the so-called age-related cognitive decline. This is a topic from a different, a different lecture, maybe next year. And what we see in the age-expected cognitive decline, we see the white patches in the brain of the MRI. And this mark is ischemic, ischemic lesion in the brain, area that are malperfused, small tissue. And this, this patient is fully healthy. She didn't have strokes, she didn't have myocardial infarction, no diabetes, nothing. Only the expected cognitive decline. And again, we are in the wound business. We see it's appropriate wound, we are treating the wound. And you can see in the middle before and after. And you can see the significant increase in perfusion. No discussion. This is your brain before. This is your brain after. We can measure the delta. Of course, the cognitive functions are improving. But we are not treating cognitive. We are treating wounds. I will make a pause over here because my time has finished. But what we are presenting over here, it's a new perspective of how to look at the brain like a tissue. Surprise, surprise. It's in indeed a tissue. And the basic things that needed for wound care in the peripheral, in the leg, or other parts of the, of the body, the basic are must also for the wounds that we have in this undirectly visualized tissue. And all we need is to present the brain in the same manner we see the other wounds in the body. Thank you very much. So we think about exponential technology getting smaller. Is there any way to uh, get a hyperbaric chamber uh, to your home or your bedroom so that we can apply these technologies more globally? I assume that at some certain point we can get to that, but I must say that the current sucks that people are buying for their home, it's not that. Here we are generating fluctuation from certain level up back to the normal, and you saw it. It's chamber, you need to take the mask on, you need to, to put it on. But like anything new, when we are starting with it, it's still not accessible for everybody. I still remember the first cellular phone that my father has bought. It okay. was a suitcase. Yeah. And today, everybody has it. So I assume this process will happen along the way. And if uh, other folks outside the world want to get into hyperbaric medicine, what's a way to do that? What's happened now is what we are doing in Israel is being replicated to other locations around the world. Actually, the first center that is replicable of us in the U.S. is going to be open in May in Florida. And soon, additional center will be open all over. Great, Great work. Thank you, Shai. Thank you very much.